Hi everyone. The video you're about to watch is part of the Age Presents Lecture Series. The series is produced by the American Aging Association to provide an introduction to foundational and advanced topics in general science. As you watch this video, I would like for you to keep three points in mind that will help you understand the importance of biological aging. One, aging is the primary risk factor for disease, including cancer, metabolic syndrome, and most neurodegenerative diseases. Two, the scientific approaches that are being used here today, such as the model systems that help researchers learn more about the mechanisms within these age-related diseases. And three, mostly centers around you, what is your interest in aging research? Whether it's biological, translational, or clinical, how would you like to contribute to the field? And if you're not already a member of the American Aging Association, I would encourage you to visit our website to learn more about us and consider joining today. Age members receive free access to the journal GeroScience, reduced registration for our annual meeting, opportunities to interact with many of the leading researchers in the field, and access to all of the lecture slides and the notes that are being used here today. And there's more. We have a very active trainee chapter with many opportunities for networking and career development. And last but not least, I would like to acknowledge and say thank you to our sponsors for the Age Present Lectures. The University of Washington Healthy Aging and Longevity Research Institute, the Jackson Laboratory Aging Center, and the Nathan Schott Centers of Excellence at both of these institutions. Thanks for listening and enjoy the lecture. Hello and welcome to this edition of Age Presents. I'll be your host today. My name is Scott Leiser. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Molecular and Integrative Physiology and Internal Medicine at the University of Michigan. My email address is shown below for anyone who has comments or questions about this lecture. Today I'm going to talk about intercellular communication and aging. But before I can talk about intercellular communication, I need to talk about aging itself. Aging is the number one risk factor for eight of the 10 leading causes of death in the United States. Six of them are shown here, including diabetes, heart disease, stroke, kidney disease, influenza, and Alzheimer's. And more recently, during pandemic times, we've added an additional uh, disease that aging is the biggest risk factor for, and that, of course, is COVID-19. Our current way of treating these diseases has generally been to treat them individually. You show up to the doctor, you have a certain disease, you have a certain problem, you treat the problem. This has worked really well. We've spent billions and billions of dollars doing great science, focusing on things like kidney disease, stroke, cancer, et cetera. And we've made some inroads in some of these diseases and less in others, depending on the disease. But the approach of treating each disease individual, individually is very inefficient. And I think the more efficient approach would be to treat the common cause of the disease. To take a prophylactic approach to treat the aging process itself and thereby by doing so, slow aging and also slow or prevent the effects of all these other diseases at the same time. This would seem to be a much more efficient way of doing medicine. The next question, of course, as a scientist is how to study aging. There are four major model organisms that have been used extensively in studying aging, although there's additional model organisms, including humans, that have been used at some, at some degree of success as well. Each of these four model organisms, they each have benefits and drawbacks. And so when you're studying aging, the benefits of yeast include its simplicity. You can do a lot with, with yeast. They're single cell. You don't have to worry about strange behaviors. They have really manipulatable genetics and small genomes. They're still eukaryotic cells, and you can do extremely high throughput with exponential growth. With the nematode Centerobditis elegans, they're still simple, but they're now a multicellular organism. So you can actually look at how these 959 somatic cells crawl around in a plate. They also have very easy to manipulate genetics, and they're highly screenable because they're also trans translucent in addition to genetically simple. The fruit fly or vinegar fly, Drosophila melanogaster, is also simple. It's also genetically manipulatable, but it has a little bit more complex behavior as a slightly larger and more complicated organism. And then, of course, the most common, the mouse mus musculus, is much more complex. It has all of the tissues uh, that a human has and is much more translatable and can do more complex behaviors. 
Unfortunately, each of these models has drawbacks. Uh, in yeast, being single cell is a huge drawback since obviously uh, as humans, we are not single cell. And so the communication from cell to cell is really important. There's no behavior in yeast to speak of. And the simplicity ends up being a negative when you're looking at much more complex genomes like the human genome. With worms, you have the uh, negative drawbacks of they're all post mitotic, which means they don't have stem cell activity, which is very important in mammals. They have fewer tissues than mammals do. And that, again, their simplicity, where while it's a benefit for studying, can be a drawback for comparing it to mammals. With flies, you get a similar fewer tissues problem as with worms. And then you get the aspect that they're evolutionarily very distant from mice. They're similarly evolutionarily distant as worms are to mice. And finally, working with mice is great, uh, but is not always translatable. And more importantly, the genetics is very slow. All of the work in mice is very slow. Mice live two to three years, and the studies can be very, very expensive. If you move this forward into humans, which is not on this slide, obviously you have no ability to manipulate genetics. Uh, the time is increasingly long and the expense is really high, but obviously anything you get out of a human study is immediately translatable to other people. The good news is that people in the aging field for the past 30 to 40 years have developed a series of longevity pathways. And these pathways are illustrated here. This is just a subset of the known longevity pathways in various organisms. And from these longevity pathways, what has been found is that aging slash longevity is conserved from yeast to nematodes, to flies, to mice, and to people. And that's my four, then four-year-old daughter in the picture. And so what you see is you have pathways like insulin-like signaling, that when you decrease insulin-like signaling, which can't be done in the yeast because it's a single-celled organism, you can increase lifespan in nematodes and in flies and in mice. And there's a lot of good evidence that decreased insulin-like signaling is probably beneficial for human lifespan. Similarly, dietary restriction, which is defined as decrease in uh, nutrient intake without malnutrition, increases lifespan in all of these organisms, and there's good evidence that it'll be helpful in humans. Decreasing the target of rapamycin pathway, similar to decreasing the insulin-like signaling pathway, also is beneficial in lots of organisms. And then a couple additional pathways where increasing sirtuin activity is beneficial in most organisms, and more recently, decreasing oxygen levels can benefit some organisms. Now, if you look at all of these longevity pathways, there's a single thing that comes to mind that they all share, and that common denominator is stress. What I mean by this is that insulin-like signaling and the target rapamycin, for example, are pathways who get turned on in good times. And so when the environment is good, when you're your brain and your uh, other tissues have decided you've got plenty of nutrients, there's no danger that you're under, you're in a situation replete with food, comfortable environment, shelter, etc. You turn up insulin signaling and you turn up TOR to help grow and reproduce. And the downside of this is it tends to age fast, to age you faster. Whereas when you have insulin-like signaling decreased in mutations or when times are bad or when TOR is decreased when times are bad, this leads to an extension of lifespan because the body is, the theory is that the body is hunkering down and preparing for tough times and hoping to wait out till there's better times. Similarly speaking, dietary restriction is a, a metabolic stress in itself. It turns on a lot of similar pathways and sirtuins are also turned on in response to stress, whereas hypoxia is also another stress. And so this common denominator of all these longevity pathways is they either are a stress directly or they turn on stress response pathways. So that brings me to stress response pathways. The idea of hormesis. What doesn't kill you makes you live longer. And so to illustrate what hormesis is, I have this graph here on the right. And the idea behind this is that you have stress on the x-axis and then you have health and, or mortality on the y-axis. And the original idea is one of two things would happen. The first is that you have no threshold. You take a stress, and this could be a toxin, uh, this could be uh, an actual physical stress. Uh, I don't try to use psychological stress, although that's what people feel a lot, especially during the pandemic. I don't try to use psychological stress here, although it's, it is theoretically possible this would also be involved. And the idea here is if there's no threshold, every extra bit of stress will, will make health worse and uh, decrease mortality. Now, 
most stresses are not going to act like this. The assumption was that most threat stresses would act more like this in red. This is where you have a threshold where a little bit of stress you can handle, but you get to a point, it's a breaking point, where you cross this threshold and now you get negative detrimental effects of stress. And this makes a lot of sense. Organisms can't, you know, aren't going to be harmed greatly by any little uh, insult, but if you continue to give insults, you'll end up causing damage. Now, hormesis is what's seen very, very frequently in the lab and probably in the environment as well. And that's the idea that under stress, organisms actually get healthier under low stress. And so this is called a hormetic effect. And the idea here being that at really low levels of stress, there isn't really much damage, but you still turn on a lot of the stress response, stress protection pathways, which help defend you against future stress or just protect the soma as it is. Now, obviously, if this stress gets too, too great, you end up in a point where you end up with negative detrimental effects on health and mortality. So these stress response pathways are really important in cell, cellular and systemic maintenance. And they've also been shown to be involved in delayed aging models and to correlate with longevity. And what I mean by that is that organisms with stress response pathways that are more turned on tend to live longer within species and between species, organisms that are longer lived tend to have better stress resistance. And this makes a lot of sense since you would never want to make body parts for an organism that's going to live 20 years that only lasts two years. And likewise, there's no reason for an organism that lives two years to make a body part that's going to last for 20 years if the organism is going to be dead within two years. So this is the idea that the stress response, stress resistance goes along with longevity. So today, as I mentioned at the top, I'm talking about perception of stress and I'm talking about intracellular signaling and stress. And so the idea here is that organisms, single cell organisms, multicellular simple organisms, more complex organisms, and then much more complex organisms like humans, all perceive their environment. And they take, they take note of their environment and they receive environmental cues. And some of these cues can be from, the in, from internal, many of these cues are also external. And so when they get these environmental cues and perceive stress, they're able to, usually the neurons, but sometimes other tissues as well, send signals that affect the rest of the organism. And so these signals, these intracellular signals, cause changes in physiology in the organism. And obviously the ones we're interested in, being interested in longevity, are the signals that lead to changes in physiology that improve health and longevity. The next question to ask is, of course, why should we care about intracellular signaling? I just named five longevity pathways, and that's just the tip of the iceberg for how many longevity pathways there are out there. And so the question, why do we care about the intracellular signaling aspect about this is, is a valid question. And I think the best way to illustrate this is in the next two slides, the first of which shows what would happen in a perfect world. So if you took these longevity pathways, like dietary restriction, decreased insulin-like signaling, increased sirtuins, decreased TOR and increased skin one nerf two, which is another stress response pathway. And the only phenotype they had was increased longevity. That would be great. Unfortunately, that's not how reality works. All of these pathways have drawbacks and have side effects. And so what you get in the real world are side effects that look like this. And so this is a whole list of effects. Now, this is not all the effects, but there's a lot more than this. But some of these effects are great, like longevity others and stress resistance. Some of these are not so great, like hunger when you're dietary restricted, like dwarfism when you have decreased insulin-like signaling, like cataracts when you decrease target or rap, when you give mice, rapamycin, for example, you get loss of fertility in many of these cases. And so there's a, a myriad of side effects caused by these longevity pathways that we'd like to get around. And the way that I think we can get around it really well is through understanding how the intracellular signaling works that we might take the positive aspects of it without so much, so many of the negative aspects. And so if we could get the longevity and stress resistance with as little of these other things as we can possibly have, that's where intracellular uh, communication and longevity can play a major role. So I'm gonna talk about these signaling pathways in a little bit of detail in a couple pathways, and then in less detail in a couple more pathways. 
And the first pathway to talk about, which was the first genetic pathway discovered to increase longevity, is insulin-like signaling or insulin signaling. So it was long thought that not a, a single gene would never ever be able to increase longevity by itself. That aging was such a complicated uh, process that it would be multifactorial and you'd never be able to do very much with one gene. You'd have to modify hundreds of genes and that wouldn't be feasible. And it was in 1993, and it was actually before 1993 that it was first discovered by Michael Klass that a single gene could increase lifespan. That gene was then identified by Tom Johnson as age one. And then that pathway was fleshed out, uh, starting with this landmark paper in 1993 by Cynthia Kenyon's lab, showing that you can, if you just knock down insulin signaling in the nematode C. elegans in a worm, by knocking, knocking down through mutation, uh, this DAF2, which is the insulin receptor, you can increase lifespan by 50%. I'm sorry, increased lifespan by over 100%, I spoke incorrectly. And this was discovered in C. elegans through this pathway known as DOWER, where worms can take this alternative development where they go into a reproductive diapause. I'm sorry, a developmental diapause. Now, what was, what was eventually found is that this DAF2 insulin-like signal signals through age one, which is the gene that was previously identified, which ends up being PI3 kinase, and then signals to another gene called DAF16 and C. elegans, which is known as FOXO in mammals. So this pathway started out the rise of genetic pathways involved in longevity. But how does this involve intracellular signaling? And the answer was it was from another paper that they published about a decade later that showed that first, DAF16 FOXO was important in the intestine. So they found that if you take a knockout worm, a DAF2 knockout that's long lived, and you get rid of DAF16 in purple, you get no benefits. And then if you overexpress, you re-express it in the neurons, you still don't get a benefit. What you see when the, in the intestine is you do get a benefit when you re-express DAF16. And so you've got these short-lived DAF16 worms, the DAF16, DAF2 double mutant worms are no longer, no longer lived. You have these nice long-lived DAF2 worms. And the only, the only tissue where you get a benefit from re-expressing DAF16 is in the intestine, suggesting that that is the key tissue for FOXO to increase longevity. But how does this involve intracellular signaling? Well, th for this, they did some really elegant experiments, one of which I've illustrated here, where they took DAF2, DAF16 double knockout animals, and they overexpressed DAF16 in these worms. What they found first is when they did this by tissue, the DAF16 would be overexpressed in whatever tissue for example, the intestine, that, that it was expressed and you get this downstream gene, which is called SOD3, would be expressed in the same tissue as DAF16. And so if you overexpress DAF16 in the intestine, you get SOD3 in the intestine. But when you start with DAF2 wild type and DAF16 wild type worms, these are just normal wild type worms, and then you overexpress this longevity gene, DAF16, in just neurons or in just the intestine, you get SOD3 spreading that requires DAF16. So if you have DAF16 in other cells, the DAF16 uh, downstream gene is turned on in other cells, suggesting that this is involving intracellular signaling where DAF16 activity begets DAF16 activity in other cells. It was also found around this time that DAF2 was most important to be knocked down in neurons, whereas DAF16 was most important to be increased in the intestine, suggesting that DAF2 was cell non-autonomously or intercellularly signaling to DAF16. So to provide a summary for the way this, these pathways work, I've illustrated it on this, this slide right here, which is that the first thing you get is a cue, and this is followed by its target. And so in many cases, this target is a neuron, but this is not necessary, but it often is a neuron. From this target, you get signals. And so these signals can vary depending on what the target is and what the cue is. And downstream, you get responders. And so in this case, you get a responder that increases stress resistance and increases longevity. And so in the case of, of insulin-like signaling, the cues that turn up or turn down insulin-like signaling are temperature, high temperatures and worms turn this up or turn this down, low temperatures, uh, turn up insulin-like signaling, you get population density, 
you can turn down insulin-like signaling at high population, and food availability, where low food availability also turns down insulin-like signaling. The targets are neurons primarily, and the uh, insulins, insulin receptors, and neuronal DAF16 and FOXO, which when they're turned on, spread signals downstream. The signals involve insulin-like peptides, and the responder are DAF16 and FOXO, these protective genes in other tissues. So in this case, you have neuronal DAF16 sending a signal through insulin-like peptides to uh, DAF16 in the intestine. That's not exactly how it works, because what it is is actually neuronal DAF16 turns down insulin-like signaling when it's turned on, and that leads to induction of DAF16 in the intestinal cells. So this initial work brought forth the coining of the term and really the defining aspect of cell non-autonomous regulation of longevity. And so cell non-autonomous signaling had long since been discovered where genes from one cell type can affect genes and other cell types for various processes. This was the first real example of cell non-autonomous regulation of the longevity of an organism. And so this brought about a uh, entire field, which is sort of summarized in this figure from a review that was published last year, suggesting that environmental stressors frequently hit sensory neurons, leading to signals going often through interneurons and other signaling tissues to peripheral tissues where you, where you have effector proteins, sometimes feedback that affect longevity of the organism. This also led to the fact that insulin-like signaling modulates aging across taxa. So this is the pathway that is probably most well studied across organisms, including humans. You can see on the right that this is all of the evidence that you have in mice of increasing health and longevity. You can see that if you knock down, if you knock out genes in the pituitary, you can go after the growth, horm growth hormone, growth hormone receptor itself. You can go after this pregnancy associated protein called PAP-A. You can go after IGF, insulin-like growth factor, or the IGF receptor, receptor. And then you can also go after these insulin proteins, IRS proteins, and all of these can increase lifespan when you knock them down in mice. Similarly, there's evidence that decreased growth hormone, decreased IGF-1 receptor signaling, and changes in AKT or FOXO are associated with longevity in humans, largely from uh, genetic studies comparing uh, long-lived humans such as centenarians. Beyond this, it's been found now that in the fruit fly, uh, D. melanogaster, mutation of the insulin receptor substrate uh, can increase lifespan by 48 and 36 uh, percent. IGF-1 heterozygous mice also live longer than their wild-type litter mates. It's been found that lifespans of different strains of mice are inversely correlated to IGF-1 levels. So if you have lower IGF-1, you tend to live longer in different strains of mice, like wild mice. It's also been found that in dogs, life expectancy is inversely correlated with body mass. So small dogs frequently have a polymorphism have with less IGF signaling, so less insulin-like growth factor. And small dogs also live longer compared to large dogs. And finally, in people, females with low IGF-1 levels have significantly longer survival compared to females with high levels high above the median, suggesting that this, all of these pathways are conserved in fruit flies, in mice, and in humans, and in dogs, for example. So to summarize the cell non-autonomous aspects of these pathways, I'm not gonna get into all of the details, but the idea here is that in a worm, in a favorable environment, there's insulin in the brain, worms don't have a real brain, this signals through DAF2 blocking DAF16, which leads to an INS7 in release, which also hits the DAF2 receptor in the intestine, blocking DAF16 and preventing longevity. In flies, in a similar condition, they have these cells called IPCs, and these cells release uh, insulins known as DILP1 and DILP2. These can hit the insulin receptor in flies. Uh, they can also uh, cause an increase in glucagon each of which blocks uh, FOXO activity and blocks longevity. And then finally in mice, if you downregulate, uh, if you have a favorable environment, you release insulin, hits the insulin receptor at IRS2, which then sends signals, other insulins downstream to the insulin receptor. 
during peripheral tissues blocking FOXO1 activity. When the environment's no longer favorable, you block all this insulin signaling, which causes DAF16 to be induced and increases longevity. So that's the insulin-like signaling pathway. What about another pathway? Does it work similarly? Is this gonna be different? And so for the second pathway, I'm gonna talk about dietary restriction. Dietary restriction is the first aging intervention that was discovered. Uh, this was discovered originally in 1935 in a study in female rats. And it's illustrated here in the survival curve where you have your, your ad libitum, uh, eat all you want mice. And these mice live fairly short compared to your restricted either two weeks after weaning or at weaning, both of which lived substantially longer. And so the de definition of dietary restriction is the reduced nutrition without survival. I mean, sorry, without starvation. And like I said, this was the first intervention found to increase longevity and is now by far the most robustly tested and reproducible aging intervention. The first evidence of intracellular signaling affecting dietary restriction was really from the Pletcher lab. In this case, it was in Drosophila and fruit flies. And the idea here is that they found that food, food smell shortens lifespan under dietary restriction suggesting that loss of food, set, food smell was a major part of how organisms live longer under DR. So the idea here is that if you take wild type worms, fed, fed fly, I'm sorry, flies, fed flies, and you uh, feed them normally, they have a normal lifespan. If you dietary restrict them in the triangles, you have a long lifespan. And if you just give them the smell of yeast, this shortens their lifespan by about 50%. Now, there's odor receptors required for this, and they also found that when you lose these odor receptors, it extends lifespan by itself, suggesting that a good portion of dietary restriction is just the perception that you don't have food. And so if you artificially make flies think they don't have food by getting rid of the odor receptor, it extends their lifespan, suggesting this is a major player in the dietary restriction phenotype. And so how does this work? Well, in this case, you have a cue, which is food smell. And then you have a target, which is your otoreceptors in neurons in the uh, fly brain. This sends signals. These signals haven't been totally identified, but insulin, serotonin, and dopamine are the primary suspects. And downstream, in this case, it decreases stress resistance and longevity by knocking down FOXO and other protective genes. And so this is, as opposed to insulin uh, signaling, where you have a decrease causing the benefit, in this case, you have an increase of something which causes detriment. And so the idea here is this is a signal that times are good, which means you turn down your protective genes and grow fast and die young. So how might, you might ask, could this be useful? So how does this intercellular signaling present an opportunity? For this, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of my own work uh, very, very quickly in C. elegans, in worms, where you can actually do this sort of assay quite easily using a food perception assay. So the idea here is you can take worms that, that live on these agar plates with a bacterial lawn that they eat for food. So the equivalent here is, is Homer here with as much uh, as many brownies as possible. You can take them, you can move them onto dietary restricted plates where they don't have very much food, looking like this, hungry all the time. And then you can take them on these same dietary restricted plates but you can either put food on the lid or between two layers of agar so that they have to smell the food, which looks a little bit like this. They can smell it, but they can't get to it. And the idea here is using a longevity probe. So we have a reporter called FMO2 and the fact that worms are translucent, you can look at this reporter and you can see in fed conditions, it's not turned on at all. Whereas in, in dietary restricted conditions, it turns on really, really bright. At the same time, similar to what the Pletcher lab found, when you dietary restrict them and you give them the smell of food, you blunt the effect uh, su substantially, which is quantified on a graph that looks like this. And so you look here, you, you lose about 75% of the benefit of dietary restriction in turning on this longevity gene. And similarly, you lose, in this case, 100% of the dietary restriction lifespan. And so the fed worms in black are extended by dietary restriction and then when they smell the food, they actually lose the benefit completely. So the good thing that you can do with this is you can use this signaling pathway to identify small molecules that will restore it. 
And so what we did with this is you can take your fed worms and your DR worms and your food smell worms, and then you add drug to the food smell and find drugs that'll restore it to what it looks like under, de under DR. The suggestion here that these could be drugs that are also non-additive with DR. And so the idea is look for a drug that's in the same pathway and restores this. And it might be a drug that blocks the ability to perceive food, and then maybe it'll increase lifespan. And when we look at the lifespan, that's what we find. At low concentration and high concentration, the drug doesn't do very much, but at medium concentrations, you get a nice robust lifespan extension. And so, you know, taking a drug that makes it so an organism can't perceive their food as well, can increase lifespan by 25 to 35%. And so what does that mean? Well, if you go back to our pathways, under a favorable food environment, you have food smell. Uh, you also have a secondary pathway where dietary restriction turns on this uh, gene called skin one nerf 2 that was discovered by the Garente lab. And downstream of this, you are changing peripheral tissues, changing respiration and turning on this longevity gene. In the fruit fly, under favorable conditions, you smell food and this causes release of, of dopamine and serotonin, which narrows down longevity. This all acts through an odor receptor. And similarly, more recent work in mice has found that the perception of food again leads to serotonin release. You can also knock out IGF-1 receptor and olfactory neurons, which leads to enhanced olfaction. And these signals lead to increased insulin resistance and adiposity, both of which are signals for uh, shorter lifespan. So in all three conditions, favorable in food environments shortens lifespan. When you, not, when you get rid of the favorable food environment, either through drugs or by getting rid of the food itself, you don't have these signaling pathways, and so you induce these longevity genes such as SKIN1, FMO2, uh, FOXO, and other genes which prevent insulin-like resistance, improve stress response, and increase longevity. So I don't have time to get into all the details of other pathways. I think that insulin-like signaling and dietary restriction are really good examples of a couple of pathways that are involved. And so I'll just briefly mention, there's a couple more pathways. There's actually several more pathways. I won't have time to get up to all of them. Uh, one of which is proteostasis. And so the idea here is that organisms are constantly surveilling their proteome. And this proteostasis can go wrong in really any cell in the body. And when it does, it can be a problem. And so organisms have developed ways to send signals that something's wrong proteostatically. This could mean that they've you know, been poisoned by a toxin or something, or it could just mean something's wrong with that tissue or cell type. And so it's been discovered that there's a number of cues that include the endoplasmic reticulum stress, the ER stress response, a loss of proteostasis is signaled through the ER stress response, among other things. You have targets. Uh, there's a gene called XBP1 that's spliced when the ER stress response is turned on. It can be activated by this. There's signals, mostly signals involve neuronal signals, such as neuropeptides. And then there's responders, similarly to DAF16 and FOXO that increase stress resistance and longevity downstream. And in this case includes the ER stress response led by XPP1. So if you combine these pathways, this was originally done in C. elegans, where you have cells including neurons and glia that can signal through this XPP1 protein in which induces XBP1 in the intestine, activating it and increasing longevity. Similarly, when flies have proteotoxic stress, they, they act through signal or hedgehog signaling, which can turn on a gene called Glee, which uh, induces heat shock proteins and helps preserve dopaminergic function and improve longevity. And in mice, it's been found that mitochondrial dysfunction and the induction of HSB70, a specific heat shock protein, uh, each can lead to longevity through neurons. The signaling pathways going toward the rest of the organism are not yet well understood. And similarly, uncoupling protein in uh, hypothalamic neurons can lead to changes in temperature that decrease body temperature and help improve longevity. Now I mentioned there's other pathways. I'll talk about a couple of them here. Uh, one of which I studied previously is the hypoxic response pathway where inducing the hypoxic response transcription factor, HIF-1, the hypoxia-inducible factor, uh, leads to serotonin release, which changes uh, induction of this longevity gene I talked about previously called FMO2 in the intestine, which increases long lifespan. 
DAF16 FOXO is also involved in some of these pathways. Uh, similarly, in flies, the viewing of dead animals, uh, visual perception involved in seeing other animals that are dead can shorten lifespan through serotonin signaling. And so just visually seeing the environment and deciding that it's bad because you see dead organisms, this makes a lot of sense because the idea that if, if something killed your friends, maybe it's a place you don't want to be. And so this leads to changes in longevity. This actually shortens longevity. And then in mice, there's a group of uh, neurons called rest neurons that have this rest protein, which <clears throat> when it's turned on, uh, decreases neural excitability. And that excitation decrease leads to changes in FOXO that uh, probably affect longevity. Uh, this also acts through dopamine. And so you may notice a trend here that there's a few signaling factors, including serotonin and dopamine that are involved in a lot of these pathways. So to summarize what I've talked about here today, you have cues, and these cues can be external or internal. These cues go to an organism, and within that organism, a tissue uh, or a set of cells. These cells are often neurons. They don't have to be. Uh, there's a whole pathway about the germline in C. elegans, for example, that sends signals that can change longevity when things are going bad in the germline. You have targets. These targets are the organism or cell. These are receptors. These are sentinel cells. These are things like the neurons that surveil the environment. They release signals. Uh, these signals are frequently neuromodulators. They're frequently signals made by neurons, but they can also be metabolites that are made by uh, more by metabolic cells. When they're depleted in metabolites, they can release different types of things. And then you have responders. And those responders are going to act to change stress resistance and change longevity. So these responders are the types of things that turn on stress pathways or turn off stress pathways and turn on or off protective genes. So if you compare the pathways, what you'll note is that neurons are frequently leading these pathways, but not always. And this makes sense because neurons do a lot of the surveilling work for, for most organisms. There's a lot of conserved signals involved, uh, such as insulin, such as serotonin, such as dopamine, and this is in in most organisms that have been looked at. These signals are very frequently involved in these pathways. I'll also note though that sometimes these signals do opposite things. Sometimes serotonin may turn on a stress response, sometimes it may turn, may turn it off. And then finally, these cells are reporting to other tissues to maintain homeostasis. And so this is a protective measurement where you're deciding whether the environment is good or bad to tell tissues whether to grow or whether to turn on stress response. And so the idea being here that by having this surveillance, you're going to pre be prepared for what's coming. There's some differences. Uh, these include the signals, cells, and receptors. They tend to be very species specific. There's not a whole lot of overlap. Uh, the pathways tend to be similar in nature, but not identical. The side effects are really variable. And so if you decrease some of these signaling pathways, it has little to no effect, and others have huge, huge effects like decreasing insulin-like signaling causes animals or people to be smaller. And then the types of stresses are very wide ranging, as are the responses. And so this is the idea of, you know, depending on what kind of stress it is, you have a different response and you have to respond due to what the stress is. And so if it's proteotoxic, you have one response. If it's metabolic, you have a different response. And so the side effects of these stresses are also going to be different. Now there's several remaining questions in this area. And so the idea here being that Intracellular signaling has only really been going full speed for the last decade, or it was started roughly two decades ago, and you know the last decade it's really started to explode. So some of the remaining questions in the area that we love junior scientists to really get into are, how specific can we mimic these pathways? And so most of the signaling pathways and drugs that we found have been very dirty, but the idea is if we could understand the pathways really well, we could target both the cell types and the receptors to a point where we could then just get as many of the benefits as possible with as few of the negative side effects. So if we knew each of the, the cells involved in a signaling pathway, in a circuit, we could then target the correct receptors on the correct cells using things like nanotechnology. And you know, the question we don't know the answer is how specific can we get? How few can we get for the side effects of these pathways? <clears throat> 
The next question is how intertwined are the networks? So there's some question, there's some overlap between longevity pathways and in you know, the types of signals involved, the types of proteins involved. And by separating them out by the signaling pathways, you might actually be able to understand better how distinct the networks are and how overlapping the networks are. And then of course, finally, how conserved are the networks in regulating aging in humans? And this is the idea where we feel pretty confident that these networks exist in humans, but we don't know, you know, are you gonna get a 5% effect? Are we gonna get a 20% effect? You know, the types of effects you get in model organisms tend to be variable when you go to mice and will that be consistent with people? And so once we understand these networks better, you know, a lot of the drugs that are being used in lower organisms are drugs that are already used in people for other, other purposes. And so it may be possible to even go through data we already have to see how effective some of these drugs might be on people. With that, I'd like to thank you all for your time, for listening for this, to this lecture. Uh, I'd especially like to thank uh, the American Aging Association first for uh, inviting me to give this lecture. I'd like to thank Elizabeth Dean, who helped me put these slides together. I'd like to thank Alessandro Bito, who invited me personally and is going to be doing all the editing for this, uh, the production and editing for this lecture. And then most of all, I'd like to thank all of the scientists, especially the ones before me, but the current ones and the future ones who contribute to JRO science, because my efforts in this field are less than one tenth of one percent of all that's out there. And you know, what I can what I can do is minuscule, but what people in the future and people in the past have done is tremendous. So thank you all for your time.